I can say honestly, 10 years into this relationship, we're more in love than ever. We have the best sex we've ever had. We're more obsessed with each other than we've ever been. We are, think we're the funniest creatures. We don't get sick of each other ever. We spend a lot of time together. So this truly works. It's not some thing that I'm just throwing out there, you know, from my, my mind. It truly, truly, truly works. And I know if it works for us, it can work for everybody else as well. This is Awakened Love, the podcast, and I'm your host, Angel. This is a space where we get real, real about sex, love, and awakening. So strap in, let's go deep. What's up, beautiful awakened beings? Welcome to another episode of Awakened Love. Today, I have one of my dearest brothers on the show with us. Johan Erb is an Estonian American actor who's been featured in films like Zoolander, CSI Miami, just to name a few, who's also been a devoted spiritual practitioner for over 20 years. He has one of the most profound daily practices of anyone I've ever met, and he is also the creator and founder of the Pyramid Breath Method. He is an amazing facilitator, an incredible human being, a wealth of knowledge. He's also the co-founder of the Tantra of Life with his wife, Miss Rachel Pringle. And I'm so, so grateful to have him with us here today. Welcome, brother. Welcome to the show, brother. I am so grateful to have you here and excited because as we were chatting before I hit record, uh, it's not often that we've had a gentleman on Awakened <laughs> Love. <laughs> it's very fitting that it's you too, because you have been such a source of transformation and healing in my life and such an incredible representation of the divine masculine and a really balanced um, human being. So thank you for being here. Oh, it's such an honor to be here. I'm so grateful and excited. And uh, you also, I just want to thank you for being such a powerful, beautiful embodiment of mm. divinity and expansion and love and possibility. And I'm so grateful for all the ways that we have traversed in this life and been there for each other and continue to be there for each other as we open and expand and explore this whole Oof. experience of aliveness. Yes, Lord knows we cannot do it alone, honey. <laughs> <laughs> better together. <laughs> uh, yes, it is. Yeah. So for those listening who don't know you yet, Johan, I would just love you have such an amazing, interesting story. Um, so I would just love for you to share a little bit about your journey on this earth incarnation so far? So I was born uh, in Soviet Union, which as we can imagine, you know, it's pretty similar to kind of North Korea-ish vibes. For those of you that are younger don't know what Soviet Union was like, and it was, it was a pretty oppressive environment. And um, so from a very early age, I sort of, and it's only in later years that I've actually put this together, and it was epigenetically even, it's been coded in me and was part of the culture that you can't be fully expressed. You could be sent away, you could be jailed, you could be tortured, you could be shot, you'd be killed, like all these things. And so that was that was in the sort of a, the framework of, of when I was growing up. And then when I was 10 years old, my mom and I left to Finland, you know, and the world opened up in a whole new way. But also to the Finns at the time, I was like a foreign kid who was, comes from Soviet Union. So like, oh, you're Russian, you're the enemy you know, you're evil, you're bad. And obviously as an Estonian, um, to me, that was like the utmost sort of like ouchie because our country was taken over by uh, Soviet Union. And so anyway, I kept having to basically shut myself down or at least at the time with the stories that I created in my mind, that, that's the way that, you know, I could survive the situation. We kept moving from town to town. It was very challenging. And at the age of 14, I uh, was living in the city in Finland, Tampere, and I was, I was a pretty rest sort of teenager. I was definitely a lot of suicidal thoughts, definitely very lost, didn't really have a support system, a coping system. And so I, I started to go within and I started to just kind of sit at night and sort of do this homegrown meditation, if you will. And through that experience, I discovered my inner world and I had an out of body experience shortly after where my awareness left my body, flew around, came back into my body, which then got me even further interested in these 
internal practices because this for me became a lifeline right because the outer world was kind of rough and difficult and challenging I was getting all sorts of trouble you know school was difficult my relationship with my family was very difficult and um it's through these practices i discovered um so much relief and i i read uh tao te ching dhammapada bhagavad gita when i was 15 and i remember mm. specifically reading dhammapada lao tzu and i'm sorry uh tao te ching by lao tzu and just laughing and crying at the same time because it just made so much sense to my spirit to my soul and it released me in some way from this idea that i'm kind of just trapped in this body in this crazy world that didn't make sense to me at the time and then over the years uh, as i came to america and um, you know deep in my practice got initiated into kriya yoga uh, and the various different lineages I really understood the value of having a personal practice and for a long time because i was still very shut down i was also created a lot of distance from just from intimacy because i was very fearful of being vulnerable and being open which i think a lot of guys can or a lot of people in general you know you can relate to right? yes i can resonate <laughs> yeah the way that we think we're protecting ourselves but really we're shutting mm -hmm. ourselves off and so it's only in the last i would say six seven years especially with my wife and having people like you in my life that i've really gotten to um, crack myself open in a whole new way which has been the most blissful era of my life uh, having the the deep profound practice uh, that used to be very rigid and mind-based now being very embodied and really marrying the masculine and feminine marrying the shiva the shakti the yin the yang the polarities together and living from that place and now being in this place and as we do here it's like just wanting to share this blessing this gift with the world and going hey guys like you don't need to suffer so hard you know we just lost so many of the tools along the way and understandings and and we've isolated ourselves so much and now with our phones and computers and things and all that noise you know we're always looking outwards because it's so interesting however we're not getting the fulfillment that we really desire so people are even more suicidal even more depressed taking even more pills to try to mask something up and so what i'm really excited about in this life right now is facilitating this um embodiment first of all being that and then sharing these tools and um, practices and, and this awareness with the world and inviting people to join the party, you know, because it is mm -hmm. truly so much better together. And that's sort of the, the short little <laughs> active version of my life right there. Yeah, it's hard to pack it in. I mean, there's so much there. The thing that you touched on um, that I think so many people can relate to is this idea of like this fear of intimacy and this armoring that mm -hmm. happens, right? Of like, as you said so beautifully, we we believe it's the only choice we have in those moments to protect our tender hearts. Um, there's a saying in, in trauma recovery that connection is our greatest, deepest desire and greatest fear. Yeah. And it creates this like core dilemma of like reaching for it, but then um, yeah, feeling afraid of it. And as you, as you know, I can definitely resonate with that armoring and having to <laughs> learn how to put that down. And it's a never ending process. But I'm curious for you, like, obviously, Rachel, um, your beloved, who our listeners know well, because she's been on a few times, we just recorded another episode, has been a hugely pivotal part in that. I'm curious if you could kind of track or walk us through when was the first time that you maybe found a piercing in that armor or you experienced putting it down even for a moment. And then usually like we put it down, we put it back on and like, can you track that process of de-armoring your heart? Yeah. It actually started to happen when I was 29. And, mm -hmm. uh, I remember I was at the time I was in acting class, which for me was one of the most therapeutic things I could have ever done for myself. I'm so grateful for acting because it really forced me to, to see how, you know, this staccato, this this sort of a uh, thing that I was putting uh, was giving off was like I'm confident and I'm stoic and 
I'm strong. And then on the inside, I was like falling apart, you know, super insecure and like needed to control my environment. And um, I remember being in acting class and seeing this guy when we're doing this exercise. It's a Meisner exercise where it's called repetition, where you're just repeating a word or a sentence. You can't explain anything. And this guy, this big dude is bigger than me. Uh, and I'm a big guy already. And he was literally... <laughs> must have had one of the hardest days of his life and was breaking down, he was crying and, and, and he was not hiding any of it. He just stood in his pain. He stood vulnerably, like all of him. Was, he was literally, tears were streaming down his face, face and he was repeating this sentence, you know, like, your eyes are blue, my eyes are blue, yeah, my eyes are blue, yeah. you know, and I get chills right now just thinking about it. And it, it literally like a light bulb, like in a, in a comic, like pff, went off in my head and was like, oh my God, that's true strength. That's real courage is to actually mm. be open and, and be authentic and be vulnerable versus, you know, I'm fine. I don't care. That was one piece. Another piece was I'm, I was in therapy and my therapist was working on my body at the same time and she was working on my jaw. And, and, you know, and she was like trying to really get in there. And at one point she was working on my jaw so hard that I started to cry. And I don't normally cry at this time. And mm -hmm. she said to me, okay, what are you feeling right now? And I said, I'm feeling vulnerable, open and stupid. And she goes, those are the three things you're most afraid of being. And it was like this, you know, like a DMT release of like remembering like, oh my God. And I was like, wow, I've spent so much of my life so afraid to be open and then you know that was at 29 and then it took it all through my 30s <laughs> like you said to peel that onion like little by little try to take that armor off because it goes back on and it feels comfortable and familiar and then as you you know learn to take it off and learn to be with that uncomfortable feeling of intimacy uh mm -hmm. it really really changes you and you and you go like wow uh, you know, how many other folks are also living in this way. And, you know, one of my favorite quotes is success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure, right? It's like we're told Oof. the success, it looks this way when you get a lot of money and you get a lot of power and you get a lot of this and a lot of cars and houses and whatever, right? Fame, status, and you get there and you still feel empty. You still feel alone. You still feel sad and truly you you must have this other component of community and closeness and intimacy and safety without which nothing else makes any difference you know and mm -hmm. it can make you actually feel way worse about yourself and then you don't know who to trust yes. and you know how to go about it and and so yeah it's wild for anyone that would know you now and doesn't or hasn't seen that side of you to even imagine because um, for everyone listening, Johan is one of the most joyfully expressed, confident, heart open human beings, particularly men I've ever met. Um, and so, and I, I've, I think we've known each other, I mean, maybe eight or nine years now or something. So I've seen, when I met you, you were already in the practice, but I've seen still, you know, we've seen each other transform so much over that time. Um, but it's almost wild to think. And to come from Soviet Union, like such difficult, harsh external environments to where you are now, I think is just such a testament of what the work can do. Um, what do you wish more uh, men knew about this process of de-armoring the heart, opening to love, self-expression? Yeah. Yeah. First of all, I think we're really lacking the, currently the, the rituals and the practices in our culture, you know, that I, when, mm. we, when I think about back to, I mean, you know, I can't think about back to it because I wasn't there in this incarnation at least, but the times when we used to sit around the fire, right. As a tribe, as a village, and we would share stories and you, there's a sense of safety and people would be able to be expressed. And I think so many of the men, especially, you know, are, are brought up in this world. And I see this with all my clients all over the world. This isn't a country specifics as much as it is just overall uh, sort of culture right now, sadly, has been, don't you cry. That's weakness, right? Man up, you know, suck it up. 
And, and after a certain age, when you're a young boy or a young girl, where you, it's okay to cry, it's okay to, you know, uh, be expressed, and you just told her, like, shut it off. And if you do cry, it's considered a weakness. And that's like mm-hmm. one of the biggest, uh, most um, challenging things to overcome because it gets implanted at such a young age. And so the men of the world right now, you know, unless you like go to victim, right? Boo hoo, me, everything, I'm, everything is so bad. It's all happening to me, you know, which is the other extreme of it, which is also not healthy. You know, the middle ground of like, oh, vulnerability is actually courage and strength. You know, and this energy of being really, really stuck and and stoic is actually you're blocking, literally blocking intimacy and love and life force, energy, chi, Mm. uh, creativity, connection, which is what we're designed for. We're designed to collaborate. And we're also told the story of lack. There's not enough. Right. So you do you and you've climbed that mountain for you and you've. You know, so it's it's everything is a competition versus a collaboration. Even the way it is in school, the way that we're learning in school, everyone's competing against everybody versus collaboratively figuring out the solution. And so we're at a very young age told, you know, you're gonna you born alone, you die alone, you walk alone, like you know, you can't trust anyone really. And and then the, our culture and our society sadly is a reflection of it. And so what I want to tell the men of the world and, and just the, anyone, the, any way that you feel you are a man or a woman or they or them or this or that, it's like that is a totally messed up story and narrative that's so disempowering that we've been told and we still abide by and live into. And we don't have to anymore. We now have access to so much more information. Thank God for the Internet. We can literally all over the world people are popping up who are choosing to live life in a different way to be in this experiment of co-creating and and connecting and celebrating and loving and you know when we think about our our community angel it's like the people are so loving and so kind and so open and so expressed and and i i I, oftentimes i I live in this bubble and then when i go out of that bubble i'm like oh my god how how come (laughs) no one else is doing this so like pockets of people are but it's so rare and how wonderful it will be when we can gift the world with the awareness that it's not like that we're special or different. Mm. We're, we all have this ability to co- co-create and support each other and celebrate each other. There's more than enough. We don't need to compete. Let's compete against these old, you know, belief systems. If you want, if you want an adversary, <sighs> you know, let's do that and let's do it together. And so that's what I'm really, really excited about bringing into the world and especially into the awareness of men of the world right now. Mm. Brothers, Mm. I got you. You got me. We got Mm. each other. You know, let's let's evolve into this embodiment of true divine masculine, embodied masculine that balances the, Mm. the feminine, that balances the masculine in a way that everybody benefits, especially Mm. you. Yes. Oh my gosh. There's so much here. I'm going to pull a a few threads there. The first one I want to pull is you touched on something about, you were talking about, you know, the two ends of the spectrum, you have the kind of totally armored and then you have victimhood. Mm -hmm. And in the middle, what you're talking about is this like vulnerability. And so I'd love to hear you touch on from your perspective, what is the difference between victimhood and vulnerability? Because I think people fear sometimes being in victimhood. So then they miss vulnerability or they bypass it. Yeah. So I think victim is when we're in this mindset that the world is happening to us, right? Mm-hmm. I'm all, everything always goes wrong. Nothing ever goes right. You know, whenever I try something, I fail or, you know, and we have these expectations of what it should or shouldn't look like. And so we create a story mm-hmm. and a narrative and we're such powerful storytellers and we then we believe it. So victimhood is just a mindset of, of believing that the world is happening to you not that you are happening to the world or the world is happening for you right Mm -hmm. and then uh and the other side is very similar it's like i gotta protect myself because the world is happening to me so i gotta like battle the world right it's me against the world and so vulnerability on both ends is actually understanding 
Tavav, all of the contractions, and again, a reminder, you cannot have expansion without contraction. They're intricately linked. It's literally impossible to expand without contracting or vice versa, or, or the other way around. So when yes, we yes. change the narrative of, oh, all these so-called challenges are actually opportunities for me to grow and expand and learn a different perspective, a new way of looking at it, you know, then you start going towards those things, embracing those challenges, inviting even more challenge in because you'll learn how to go about that challenge differently. Now it's an opportunity. Now it's a way to expand. And when the mm -hmm. inevitable contraction happens again, you will have the awareness of, oh, this is here for me. Let me even be grateful for it, even in the midst of it feeling so difficult and challenging and disgusting at times and whatever it is. And again, <laughs> yes, not being alone in it, right? Sharing it and sharing it in a beautiful way where it doesn't feel like we're taking, but rather we're sharing where we're at. So that invites people in to support us in our growth. And, you know, want to be mindful is it's, we are ultimately responsible in what we are drawing in, you know, towards us, right? So if you are in a mm -hmm. victim mentality, you can really bring in people who need you to be a victim. And as soon as you mm. shift that mentality into, I'm not a victim, I've had a challenging life, right? And I choose to expand and choose to go towards these challenges with curiosity and excitement, because I know they're here for me, you will begin attracting people into your life that celebrate that. They don't need yes, you to be yes. a victim. They want, you, they want you to expand and open and grow, and they celebrate that and they support that. Mm, yes, love that so much. I remember you were one of the first people, and this would have been many years ago, you would, you would always say, and, and I would it really resonated with me exactly what you shared here that like there can't be expansion without contraction and after the contraction always comes the expansion and vice versa and I think it was Rilke who's like I don't know if I'm saying that right the godfather of somatic stuff in western psychology at least obviously we know in eastern psychology body-based healing has been around for thousands of years but he said like that is the pulsation of the universe that's how energy moves that's life in and out expansion contraction and it's such a beautiful thing to remember when we're <laughs> moving through um, difficult times. You've mentioned a lot this idea of like it's better together and ritual and community. And I see you, you are such a master community builder. Um, you've always been such a pillar in our community. And I've always, I've seen you cycle through just being able to build communities. It's a really amazing skill. So for people who are listening that, um, are looking for their people, as you said, they want to draw in people that can um, share in the style of living that they're wanting to expand into and moving from either armored or victimhood into vulnerability. What would be your best advice on community building? Mm. Good question. I think that one of the biggest things in creating connection is to first to seek to understand, right? To really seek to mm. understand another person before you seek to be understood. And uh, this is a big Stephen Covey Oof. thing, uh, uh, incredible author, author of uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you haven't read that book, folks, get on it. It's incredible. Um, and that approach, when we don't project our autobiographical sort of idea of the world onto people, but we allow really for, for ourselves to get curious and to, to learn about people, that's when our armor comes down. Because then we don't need to be right. We don't need to wrong anybody. Well, I'm right. They're wrong. My way is the way. Their way is the wrong way. Again, I've been there, done that majorly in my life. <laughs> so when you're really seeking to understand first before to be understood, you're allowing people's armor to come down. Because then we're not, oftentimes we live from this autobiographical idea of, of, okay, this is how life is. My way is the way everybody views life, right? And so when we take that away, when we change that narrative to, oh, this is just subjective, the way that I, I look at life. And I'm curious about their subjective reality of how they look at life. And now you're no longer fighting about who's right or wrong, who's is better or worse, rather they're different. And you're just comparing those two worlds together and then seeing how when you 
bring those worlds together, what gets created. And ultimately, we all want the same thing. We want safety, love, connection, meaning, play, purpose, right? And so that's one of the mm-hmm. best ways to, to create that is to invite people to open, to invite people to feel safe, and then to celebrate them in their uniqueness and, and not yeah. make them wrong for their uniqueness. And when, you know, I would say that our group of friends and our community is very, very unique. There is all <laughs> sorts of flavors in there, you know, and so we do a great job at celebrating each other's differences. And then amalgamating, alchemizing all the things and how we can learn from each other, how we can co-create something even more epic and amazing than just me together and just you and I together, but rather when the group grows, it's there's so much there. And so valuing each person, valuing um, uh, the, what the collective creates. And to me, that's one of my biggest excitements and turn-ons because I... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think there are many reasons, but I, you know, uh, sort of the my upbringing, bringing the stuff and the, the social sort of uh, cultural overlays of, 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 you know, not being super tight or connected to my family, but I always create a family wherever I go. And then it's, mm. you, you know, and then you're with people because you choose to be with people, not because you have to. And it's such a gift what that gives to me. And so it, I'm just so grateful for all the people in my life. And uh, I let mm-hmm. them know about that often. Yeah. Yeah. We had a, a conversation recently where I actually wept, I think, in gratitude for you, brother, because we were talking about how um, everything you described, safety and acceptance and celebration, but specifically around how you and the other men in our tribe hold such a reverence for women and the goddess and such a space of safety and this like agendaless um, support and celebration. And we were laughing because I was like, if only all men knew that if they could just create this space of safety and drop the agenda of like what they're trying to get from a woman or a, a person and create this safety, like all of their wildest dreams will come true because, you know, we look at our community spaces and women being so embodied and expressed and in their wild beauty, you know, it's that energy of actual safety and a genderless like offering at the feet of the goddess that creates all the dreams that any man could ever <laughs> hope to have. Um, and so just, yeah, it's such a, such an immense gift that I really do, do hope that spreads far and wide. Um, you've talked a lot about like practice as well and how important practice is and, you know, community, I think one of the things that I've seen you do that has really built massive communities, well, two things, there's the, the physical expression of that thing, which is you've offered a daily practice you're in your own daily practice but you've had an open door policy for i mean you invite anyone far and wide i see you whomever you meet you have an open door policy if you would like to come and sit with us and practice with us like come come sit come be in practice and this energy of generosity that you have that's quite exceptional both you and rachel hold this energy of powerful generosity um whatever i have i give to you you know and me and patrick were on the immense receiving end of that when you guys supported us so profoundly through the fire and losing everything and we were so resistant the most resistant recipients but but you broke us with your love and it was such a powerful learning lesson but you both really carry that in your spirit this true energy like it's not it's just who you are this energy of generosity so first I'd love for you to talk about like where did that come from considering the upbringing you had of not really having anything like living in actual scarcity to being so generous first. And then second, I'd love to hear about that offering of your practice that you've offered daily. And I know now it's transformed into your unique method, which is the pyramid breathwork method. And so, yeah, let's talk about generosity first. And then I want to talk about pyramid breath, which has changed my life. And I'm excited for everyone to hear about. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I first want to go back to what you mentioned before, which was, this beautiful divine um, expression in our community and in, 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 mm. in all of you beautiful women, you know, for me, and I think 
this concept really changed so much for me. I think most people in the world view God or the divine as masculine. And it wasn't until maybe about seven years ago when I realized for myself that the way that I would like to relate to divine is as feminine. And as soon as I switched that up, where God went from being the sort of like Shiva like, you know, being or the, you know, the, the, Christo Judean, you know, you know, white dude with a beard uh, who's angry and also <laughs> broke at the same time, you know, uh, and also very loving. I love it. Just George Collins and skit about it. Um, to changing that relationship to the divine as feminine. And as soon as I did that, things completely changed for me. First of all, the practice that we're going to talk about in a little bit, the Pyramid Breath Method, started to come through as a download. And I always, you know, if you guys have practiced with me, when I speak to or about the, the divine, I most often refer to the divine as her. And I think it can be very triggering for a lot of folks out there when they first hear that. They're like, whoa, what do you mean? It's a man. God is a he, you know? And I don't believe that to be true at all. I think God is all. However, we've really um, misconstrued uh, the, the feminine aspect of the feminine. So for me, I even have a tattoo of a, this, uh, you know, holy trinity on my chest here. And to me, it's, you know, goddess and God and then the Holy Spirit. And even in, in the Christo Judean, you know, the Holy Spirit, I, I talked to one of my Christian friends and I was like, oh my God, Holy Spirit is a divine mother, you know, and like light bulbs went off in his head because uh, he's a very progressive Christian in that way. And so adding that element in has been so, so powerful, empowering, creative, fun, playful, because that's what the feminine is, right? Playful, available, emotional, creative. And, and that's been such a huge part of my um, spiritual development. And again, for the, especially for the brothers out there, like I invite you to try on uh, relating to the divine as, as a feminine and seeing what comes into your life, how you treat your partner, your mother, your sister, your daughter, knowing that they are emanations and embodiments of the divine feminine. And, and it mm. changes your relationship completely in the most profound, beautiful way. And now speaking to the practice, I started practicing at the age of 14 because I was suicidal. And over the years, you know, I've always had a daily practice essentially from that age, but it was still very rigid. It was very masculine. And when I opened up to the feminine aspect, the pyramid breath method was born. And most quote unquote conscious women, uh, which is I'm fortunate to say is most of the group uh, in my life, a very large group of people that I'm very grateful for, say there's such a difference between a man who has a spiritual practice or a personal practice, a way of relating to the divine versus a man who doesn't. Right. So again, for the brothers out there, when you're listening to this, just know that when you establish a spiritual practice that is fun, that is not like doesn't take a long time. It's not all these crazy things that we've been told that you get to go and become a monk or, you know, be in a cave and meditate for years on end. No embodiment practice, breath practice that, in, you know, incorporates the masculine and femi feminine uh, components you will become the person that you've always wished you could become and beyond. Like I'm continually mm -hmm. surprised by that. The, you know, the quote that I so deeply love better and better forever and ever. It's literally a well mm -hmm. that doesn't run out. It's into <laughs> infinity. I do a practice every single day. That's very similar. Every single day. It's different. It's never boring ever, mm -hmm. ever. It's wild, you know? And so what it says to me is it's there's literally infinite ways of, of expanding and growing and learning when we align ourselves with that energy. And I've made, I've created, or it was created through me, the Pyramid Breath Method, so that it can be applied to the modern person who is very busy, who does have a job or maybe two jobs or has kids and, you know, they run a company or they're whatever they're doing. They're busy. They got a lot going on. How can you do a practice that is effective, that is short, that is powerful, 
that is visceral, not up here. I think I felt something. No, I fucking felt that. Like I know that to be true, <laughs> which is a very different experience of viscerally knowing that you are divine embodiment of love versus, yeah, I think I kind of, I can think about that being, you know, a thing is very, very, very different. And so I'm really, really excited now to bring this forward. You know, I've had a, a breath channel for some years now and people have joined and have incredible experiences, obviously, with my, uh, my personal clients uh, that I work with, but now bring in the teacher training forward. And really my desire is to be able to get it to more and more and more people all over the world. And my true dream, this lofty wild dream is that everyone has access to this practice so that everyone mm. in the world can be like, you know what? I want to stay change right now. Let me just do three minutes of this practice and feel an immediate state change instead of it's too hard it's too challenging i could never do it you know i can't afford it it's this it's that whatever excuse we would normally find so that's what i'm really really super passionate about right now uh and, and mm. just feeling the full force of the divine with me being like yeah let's bring this out into the world yes yeah, it is such a profound practice. It's extremely unique. It's very tantric. It's very embodied and creative and all, all that you just described. If you had to talk someone through it who has never done it, and of course, if you've never done it and you want to try it, where, firstly, where can they find? Is it Where's the best place for them to find you and, be, and practice with you? Com is the best place to find you. At least com, all, the other, all the other places. You know, we, yeah. we can geek out on like the science of, you know, sympathetic, parasympathetic or divergent, convergent ways of thinking. And like it activates so many different parts of us. Um, there is there is what I love about the practice so much is that it has three different modalities. The first modality is really sort of fast breath, intense breath, which literally gets us out of our critical mind into our body. And when we get into this part of our being, which mo for most of us is like cut off, right? From after we like get into teenage, it gets cut off because again, we're told it's not okay to express yourself. It's not okay to scream or cry or to shake or whatever, like suck it up, deal with it in another way. Mm -hmm. And so this practice gives you a way to be expressed. We scream, we cry, we laugh, we shake. And so we take that judgment, the shame, the story, the narrative out of the way and allow the body to express those things that have been buried deep inside. And we're literally clearing real estate inside of us so that this life force energy can flow into us. And then the mm -hmm. third part of the breath, the second part of the breath, we really like slow it down and, and really explore our sensuality. You know, again, for most men out there, this is like, whoa, like, what are you talking about? That sounds like weird or feminine or something. It's not. It's actual aliveness, literal life force energy that you are filling yourself with, which is creative energy, which will make you make more money, have better relationships, get more creative in your life, in, in, in your work, in your relationships, create more intimacy, create more connection. Like the list is endless of, of positive effects. And the third part of the, the modality, we harness all that energy and then we focus it into creating the life that we desire. And where the, mm. the practice is maybe the most unique when I compare it to other breathwork practices out there, which are all valuable and incredible. I don't want to take anything away from anybody else. They're really, really valuable experiences. However, they can be very difficult to make it a daily practice because a lot of them take like an hour of laying down and you have an out-of-body experience, which is wonderful. However, mm -hmm. if you want to stay in the body, which is what the pyramid breath method does, you stay in the body, you bring all of this into your being, and then you focus with your imagination, you create the life that you desire, and you bring it into being in the quantum, and then you bring it into being in the physical. And so mm -hmm. it, it, it's very, very practical as it is esoteric, which I think is unique yeah. and amazing. It's very structured mm -hmm. in that way. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. It's so profound. It's embodiment, it's breath, it's sounding, it's sensuality, it's meditation and stillness and awareness and sound release and visualization. It's like such an amazing amalgamation, which is why I think it's so um, creative and enlivening because there is such um, so much Shakti flowing through that practice. It makes total sense to me that as you opened up to receive God as a woman, that this practice flowed through you because you really feel the the balancing effect of it and you really feel Shakti, this alive, creative energy. So uh, I know that you have, I believe you have, enrollments open for the teacher training. So the one thing I want to say as well for people listening is that um, you don't need to necessarily know you want to be a teacher or facilitator to know that you want to go that deep with a practice. It's like a lot of people do their yoga teacher training as the next way to deepen their personal practice. And then, you know, end up teaching or facilitating, which is awesome as well. But just a little tidbit for people listening, like if you just want to deepen your practice, um, what else would you say if people are interested in enrolling, um, to learn how to teach this method yeah, and share so it and spread it? Like you said, it, this this doesn't mean that you necessarily want to teach this. This is really a crash course in in the pyramid breath method. Like you will get all the different bits and pieces and parts of it. And there's a lot of mechanics that take a little bit of time to master because we're using utilizing bandhas, internal locks. You know, we're moving, we're sounding, and in time, if you wish to guide, you know, you are doing the practice and speaking at the same time, which takes a little bit of getting used to. And this is great for, uh, you know, if you are a professional, as in like a coach or a psychiatrist, a psychologist, if you're a nurse, if you're a doctor, if you anytime you need to hold space for people, it's also if you're mm. a mom or a dad or you run a company, you know, and you need mm. to just you feel overwhelmed a lot in your life, which we do because there's so much stimuli happening everywhere all the time. How can I not just shut it all off or turn it up? How can I actually alchemize this energy? And how can I alchemize my internal uh, energies that, um, you know, maybe some childhood trauma or, or, you know, very challenging experiences instead of wanting to get rid of it. How can I turn this seemingly disempowering experience, this very challenging, seemingly negative experience into a positive, empowering experience, right? So we dive deep into the somatics of, of healing ourselves and taking our power back. So we don't place the power outside of ourselves and go like, I need this person to heal me. You know, they can mm -hmm. be a, a, a helpful in your healing process because ultimately you heal yourself. We are the ones that we have been waiting for. We are the ones that create the narrative, the story, the, uh, our life in the way that we make meaning out of the life. And the only way we can actually get to that point is if we have the tools to slow down, to, to examine, mm -hmm. to acknowledge, and then to reevaluate and then actually put that energy towards creating something that we feel is empowering, supportive, not just for ourselves, but for our community and the world. Hmm. Hell yeah. Pyramidbreathwork.com. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> run, don't walk. Um, very exciting. This, yeah, this practice has changed my life and it's such a, it's such a profound, beautiful awakening experience that is so, con so consistently delivers, as you said, like it really, yeah, it never, never gets old. It's, it's such a powerful, intelligent system. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited for this next level of it being in the world. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. I want to shift gears slightly because I, we have pr predominantly um, a female audience mm -hmm. um, and we have an opportunity here with a beautiful conscious man. And I know a lot of women listening either are in partnership and desire their partner to be more conscious or are not in partnership and would love to attract a conscious man into their life. So I would love to hear like for the ladies looking for love, what would be your advice on attracting and dating a conscious man? Yeah. Well, I'll start with the bad news. The bad news is there's not a lot of <laughs> conscious men out there. And, uh, and yeah. I, that's sadly the consistent feedback I get. And um, the good news, 
however, is that you, ladies, can have a really profound effect on that. And yes, you know, yes. if I if I would describe my wife in, in two words, I would describe her as relentless love. And it mm. is through her love that I have opened to this capacity, and also through relating to the divine as feminine, inviting that guidance in. And so when you as a lady embody the divine feminine that is responsible. And there's different narratives out there of what divine, divine feminine is. And some of the narratives is like, I am the storm, deal with it, right? And that's gonna, yeah. that's gonna <laughs> throw the guy, especially if he doesn't have the tools yet, into a trauma response. He's gonna either fight you, he's gonna run away, yeah. or he's gonna shut the fuck down, right? And so it's mm -hmm. really, really important to take responsibility in the way that we show up. And I invite you ladies to, to see in the man in front of you, the possibility of him being, of becoming a conscious man and helping mm. him get there, right? Yes. Inviting him to step onto that path by first being an example of that, what that looks like. And secondly, giving him help and tools, encouraging him, not shaming him for where he is, but really being an invitation because it's scary. Because dudes like to know and to be right and, you know, being the knowing. Being in discovery is really, really scary. And so if you're being shamed for it, which a lot of us have been, you know, by different unconscious mm -hmm. partners, so to say, it's so important to learn the language of love, to learn what Rachel and I call co-devotional communication. Perhaps it's called conscious communication. Perhaps it's called you know, there's a lot of different names, authentic re relating. There's so many different ways to communicate in such a way that we take responsibility, first of all, for ourselves always, and then mm -hmm. not project onto other folks what we think they should be versus, again, first seeking to understand, then to be understood, and then creating possibilities and opportunities for these men, if they're willing and ready, to step into that, making it sexy, making it empowering, making it feel good, championing them. And we're also capable of learning. We're also, I was not this guy always, like I was very different, you know? So if I can do it, anyone can do it. With like, you know, mm. uh, if, unless you're like seeing somebody who clearly has other things going on, like they're a sociopath or a narcissist or unable to, or uninterested in any of that, right? Which is luckily a very small percentage out of, you know, out of the, the whole population of this planet. Uh, but most folks are neurotypical brains. And so they're actually designed for this. We want to feel connection. Yes. We want to feel love. And then when we get acknowledged and appreciated for it, we want to do more and more of it, right? And so I really believe, and I hate to like put it on you ladies in that way, but you guys are the gateways for so many of us. Because when we hang out with our dudes mm -hmm. and we watch sports and we talk about nothing, that's not where it's coming from. Somebody mm. out, out of that circle needs to be the gateway. And again, that's why, you know, send them to me. Send them to me. Uh, <laughs> yes. And I will be like, yo, I used to be you. And trust me, this is way better than being that one. You know, because we all want it. We all want connection and love. And to be in a, in a group of women and the women feeling completely free and open to, to be in their most beautiful, wild, essential expression. And the only way to get there is if we grow and expand, you know. And so it's it's... Mm -hmm. Everybody benefits when we step on the, onto this path or choose this way. And it's just reminding yes. the guys out there of that. And there are examples because sadly right now, you know, the heroes out there, the, you know, the men look up to are, are not conscious. There are some, there are some that are, you know, and luckily more and more so. And, uh, and but we need those examples. We need to model something, right? And so send them yes. the way, whether it's me or another conscious man, send them to their site, mm -hmm. you know, have them read books or watch, you know, documentaries or listen to podcasts. There's so much stuff out there and, and men love to learn, especially when yes. they're not yes. being shamed or blamed or guilted. Yes. Oh my God. Preach. I'm so grateful that you shared 
what you just shared, because I mean, listeners have heard Rachel and I have this conversation about how women, when it comes to love, are actually the leaders. But it's really nice to hear it from a man too, of like, you know what? Like, what if our ladies, like what if our love could be the awakening agent? And as you said, it takes a man who is willing for sure. And I think that's something I talk about with clients a lot too, is that it's, it, there has to be an alignment of values, but the expression of those values might not yet look very similar. Like when I met my husband, Patrick, like he has a deep value. His number one value is growth. And that's my number one value. So that's going to work. There's a willingness to grow together, but his expression of what growth looked like was different to mine. And so that was really helpful for me. He gave me a lot of codes around business and, you know, like ver- his version of growth that he had flexed that m- muscle. And then I was able to love him open and give him codes of growth around opening and expression and love. And so we get to give each other those gifts. And yes, I think that is actually really empowering because the story I hear so often is like, oh, there's no conscious men. And and it's like beautiful for you to acknowledge like, yeah, there aren't that many conscious men, but we get to wake the the world up together and it gets to be fun and sexy. I like this idea of like, seducing a man awake, like being the seductress of light and like stimulating and massaging out his potential. Um, So that's really exciting. And I'm really, really glad that you phrased it in that way. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about bouncing back from conflict. Mm -hmm. You and Rach have such a beautiful practice of co-devotional, as you say, communication and many years of being in this work together. I think, have you guys been together nine years now? It'll be 10 in April. Wow, coming up on ten years, yeah. honey. Um, you got some. You got some time in in the bank, and have really been in this practice together. Um, what What do you immediately do, or what's the first thing you do when you experience a rupture together? How do you? What happens first? And and like talk us through how you guys repair. Yeah. So again, this is ten years in, right? So. This is, we, we not only practice this, we teach this. As we teach this, we learn even more about this. In the beginning, you know, you're, you're rubbing against each other's paradigms being different, right? Because we all, again, we all we don't realize how much of the worldview that we've made up in our mind is we've just taken things and we just, and we want to defend things to the death and be like, no, it's this way. And they're like, no, it's that way. And often, like we, Rachel and I have found that sometimes we're arguing about something, especially in the past, and we're actually agreeing, but we're using words that are different. So we're making different meaning out of it. And then it Mm. would take us like sometimes days or weeks to even be like, oh my God, we're actually, this is a non-argument. Like we actually agree or we're using (laughs) different words and and making different meaning out of the way that we were expressing. So it's really, really, really important to get really clear on, again, that you are actually talking about the same thing. So again, first seek to understand. So when we get into a rupture, we slow things way down. I like to call it, we add in breath and awareness, right? Slowing things down, things down. So your, your, your nervous system is calm. Cause if you're not calm or calm enough, you're talking to not your brain, you're talking to the trauma which means you're not really talking at all. You know, people do the craziest things when they're in a a trauma response, like we're we're capable of murder, we're capable of the most horrible things because we're not thinking. And so how can we first slow, slow, slow things down, calm our nervous systems with co-devotional communication? We're taking 100% responsibility for the way that we have been showing up. And then adding in that awareness part, which is, hey, I know this feels so difficult and challenging right now. And I know that this is happening for a reason. This is here for us. So let's get grateful for it right now. Even though we don't like each other right now, we think we're the worst and we you know, wanna run away or shut down or get into a fight. Let's just get first get grateful that we're chosen each other to, to uncover this mystery, this magic that's here for us. And then, when we do that, we're no longer, one of us needs to be right or wrong, right? You take that out of the equation. You can then be in discovery of what the, the magic of this is. What is this teaching us? And for us, because we mm. teach this, is like, oh, this is here so we can teach this. So we're in this contraction right now. Mm. 
so we can share our experience with our clients and with the world, right? So we created that narrative. If we didn't have that narrative, maybe it would just be like, it's here for us so we can feel more intimacy and closeness and trust and safety going forward. So that when the same thing happens again, because things tend to happen over and over again, right? We have a better mm -hmm. way to approach it. We can see it coming further away, you know? And then as it's happening, we can slow it down and the way we are going about it will be different. And we can hold each other, honor each other, and celebrate each other uh, and learn from it all at the same time. And so now you're converting this seemingly very challenging, difficult, shitty, awful situ situation. That's okay, situation. Mm -hmm. That's like shitty situation. <laughs> it's a shit situation. <laughs> That's a good one. We should, we should uh, trademark that. Yeah. Are you in a situation right now? <laughs> I got to say, um, you know, so when you're in a situation, it's really, it's really understanding that everything is again here for us, right? It's a gift. It's a blessing. Oftentimes blessings are disguised, right? They're just really, really disguised, but it's all here for us. And when we add in that narrative and that approach, whew, things just melt so quickly you repair so quickly. And we always, first of all, we don't like to use words always and never. However, in, in this context, <laughs> we, we, we do our best to really honor each other in the way that we showed up in the situation. To speak to like, wow, like I, I'm so impressed the way that you were able to hold this energy and this energetic. And even though you went to a trauma response, the way that you handle it, like, we really acknowledge each other, which then makes us again mm. want to do what? Do even better, grow even more in that direction, which creates more intimacy, more trust, more love. I can say honestly, 10 years into this relationship, we're more in love than ever. We have the best sex we've ever had. We're more obsessed with each other than we've ever been. We are <laughs> think we're the funniest creatures we don't get sick of each other ever. We spend a lot of time together. <laughs> so this truly works. It's not some thing that I'm just throwing out there, you know, from my, my mind, it truly, truly, truly works. And I know mm. if it works for us, it can work for everybody else as well. Again, if you're in a, you know, in a relationship with somebody who has a neurotypical brain um, and uh, who's willing to grow and expand. Yes, preach. Yeah, I think the two things that feel so important, like for people to really remember is that what you just spoke to, which was like a self responsibility and then B acknowledgement. It's like, how different are those two points from victimhood, blame, shame? It's like a whole different paradigm. Um, so yeah, and I can really testify to the love that you guys share, um, and what a blessing it is to witness and, and receive from that love because it really does give to our community. I'm so grateful for that, man. Like I have so many incredible templates for divine union around me, which it seems rare. And yet I look around and I have so many friends who have the most incredible relationships and everyone's doing it differently and figuring it out in their own way. But I don't know if Patrick and I would be where we are if we didn't have such incredible models for love and relating and how it can be done differently. Um, I know Patrick definitely said like, I don't know if he would have, because when we first met, he did not believe in marriage. And now to be in the place where we're married and he was like, couldn't wait and was so excited about it. So much of that is because of couples like you and Rach and many others that we have in our life that make it look fun and like an amazing adventure that it can be. So, oh, so deeply grateful to you, brother, and so deeply grateful to Rachel and the love that you share. I love you both so immensely and deeply and profoundly. And I'm really excited for all of our listeners to get to receive your medicine and for those that feel ready and feel the call to deepen their personal practice and to also have the facilitation capacity to facilitate such a profound ritual and breathwork ceremony i mean yes 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 head to pyramidbreathwork.com also what is your instagram handle for people to follow it's along with you Herb johan on instagram and i want to say one more thing which is we do have this amazing yes. uh, offering that's up on both of our websites which is called tantra of light and which is our four-week course yes. of you know basically the amalgamation of all the things that we talked about today 
And uh, it's super affordable. It's such a great investment. I highly, highly recommend it. We want to make our tools available. We have clients that are, you know, one on one or two on one or two on two, and it's 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 a different type of rate system. But we want to really make sure that we make our tools available for everyone, regardless of yes. if you have yes. zero dollars or you have a billion dollars, you know. And so it's like it's so important that we all learn and grow and have access to this information. And uh, and I'm mm-hmm. so deeply, profoundly excited to share this with you all. And as you guys know, Angel obviously has so many tools that you're one of my teachers. I'm so grateful for you. And, uh, and, you. and, we and yeah, we brother. do. And that's what we all get to do for each other, right? As a community. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I really love about us, um, not that we're loving uh, on ourselves, is that we don't, <laughs> we, we, don't, all we, don't we don't elevate ourselves above other people, right? My intention and our intention is never to go from eye to eye to like, you know, looking down on you or looking up at anybody because truly we are the ones and we are the generation that we have been waiting for to do this together. We are the guru, the teacher, the student all in one. We are here for each other to learn and to grow. And that's the way forward, I believe, is in the togetherness Mm -hmm. of all of us. And that's the power of the togetherness of all of us, because it creates this morphic morphic field that penetrates everything. And then everyone is just Mm -hmm. on the same page and and changes, literally changes everything. Yes, community collaboration. It is way, way better together. Just I want to make sure the the course that you and Rachel run together is on tantraoflife.com. No, it's on pyramidbreath.com as well. As well as, oh, it's on, oh, it's uh, yeah, awesome. as well as I am rachelpringle.com okay. on, on Rachel's site as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay, perfect. And I know as well, just in case people are wondering, Johan does one-to-one coaching. You and Rachel coach couples together. So there's also there's all sorts of ways yeah. that people can engage with your mastery and um, just the wealth of knowledge that you have. It's very exciting. Yeah. I'm going to do some rapid fire with you before right. we wrap up. Yeah. You ready? Okay, biggest turn off. Oof, I would say people who are cheap in nature, who are, uh, you know, mm. this, the opposite of generosity, whatever that is. <laughs> yes, biggest or fastest way to turn you on, I should say. Ooh. Authentic, vulnerable embodiment. Ooh, love. What's the most important thing for successful relationships, in your opinion? Uh, I would say conscious communication, co-devotional communication, taking 100% responsibility. Mm-hmm. That was Rachel's answer. <laughs> so <that's>, there's <laughs> an alignment there. <laughs> uh, what makes you feel most safe in your relationships? What makes me feel most safe? Uh, I would say the mm-hmm. same. It's, it's, it's the feeling that each person is truly available and truly we're not hiding any parts of ourselves everything is always there and that we know that we are able to face the music at any time with love with uh yeah i would with love Mm, yes yes how do you know when you trust someone Mm, it's a feeling in my belly it's a feeling in my heart Mm. it's usually a feeling of i can fully fully feel the other person when I touch them, when I hug them, when I speak to them, I feel that all of them is revealed to me. They're not holding back, they're not manipulating, they're not trying to steer in any direction, they're just there and available. Mm, Yes, I can feel that in my body. (laughs) What is the most attractive quality in human beings to you? I would go back to generosity of heart, mind, soul, spirit, generosity of, of sharing your true self. Mm. Yes. Yes. If you could be any animal, what animal would you be? Ooh, you know, I really love pelicans. <laughs> I, I think I'd be a pelican. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I did not expect that. That's awesome. Hell yeah. To the pelican. <laughs> Amazing. What's your kink or one of your kinks that comes to mind? I have many. Um, Let me think of something uh, that I can share here. Um, 
<laughs> you can share anything here, honey. Sure. Um, <laughs> you know, I would say that uh, naughtiness is definitely my kink. And it comes in many, many various forms, but just doing naughty things is my kink. Mm -hmm. yeah. Am I picking up on like, by naughty you mean taboo? Yes. Yeah, nice. Love that. Oh, thank you so much for being here, brother. And I cannot wait for all the Awakened Love community members to find you and get the benefit of your brilliance in this lifetime. Oh, thank you, sister. I appreciate you. I love you. Thank you so much for having me on. Thanks for doing what you do. And I'm just so excited to have you in my life and just continue to explore together with all of you guys listening to explore together this life and truly to better and better forever and ever, my friends. Thank you. Mm, better and better forever and ever that's it for today awakened one and just a quick thank you from me thank you for gifting us with your most precious resource your time and attention so that we can make this world a more awakened place and if we're not friends on instagram yet then we absolutely should be so come on over and say hello at angelica alana and i'll see you there and see you next week